Hey, good morning, Rock Point Church. Thomas here. I'm so excited to be with you here this morning. Whether this is your first time or you've joined us each week, today is a day that the Lord has made. And so we're going to rejoice and be glad in it together. You probably already know that it is Memorial Day weekend. So as a church, we thought it was so important to take a moment this morning to stop, acknowledge, and honor those who have served and sacrificed their lives, both men and women, for our great country. At this time, we're going to enter into an awesome time of worship. So I want to encourage you to engage with us this morning, however that might look for you, whether it's standing, singing, clapping, dancing, shouting. We want to encourage you, engage with us this morning. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this morning. I pray that you would bless this time of worship in Jesus' name. Amen. Sing that. Raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemy. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah.
so good. Thank you. That you'll never let us down, God. When we fall, when we stumble, when we fail, when we make mistakes, you're there to catch us, Lord. Thank you for this time of worship. I pray that you would bless it. God, I pray that it would glorify your name. In Jesus' name. What an awesome and powerful time of worship. Thanks so much for joining us. If you're just tuning in, my name's Thomas. And here at Rock Point Church, we have awesome and unique opportunities going on throughout each week, including new opportunities to gather together in person with just a couple of caveats. The first is that it's a maximum of 25 people per event. We can't exceed 25 people, so we need to make that clear. We're gonna be encouraging social distancing, which means six feet apart at all times. And although masks will not be required, they are certainly welcome. If you need a mask or maybe you can't maintain six feet distance, go ahead and bring a mask where we would still love to have you and we would love to see you. We're gonna do our part as a church and a staff to make sure everything is nice and clean and all the common areas are nice and disinfected. But some of those opportunities are so unique and so powerful. The first is that our young adults are meeting on Sunday mornings here at the church at 10 a.m. We're gonna to participate together and engage in the online service and then have group discussion to follow. It's a great opportunity and you don't wanna miss it. Youth is back on. We're meeting Wednesday nights. The middle schoolers are meeting from 6 to 7.15 at the church, and the high schoolers are meeting from 8 to 9.15. We have a nice gap in there in the middle so that parents can pick up their youth promptly and there won't be any overlap, but it's such an awesome opportunity to gather together. Our life groups are still happening. Some of them are happening on Zoom. Some of them are meeting in person. If you're not involved in a life group yet, you need to be. Life groups are where life happens. We believe that the church is supposed to meet in the temple or in the church building and house to house. Life groups are so important and you need to be involved in one. On Saturday nights at 7 p.m. here at the church, we have a unique opportunity to gather together for our pre-service prayer. This is new, it's special, and it's awesome, and we want you there. Please come and join us on Saturday nights for pre-service prayer. Finally, we want to encourage you and remind you to give to the house of God. You can do that at rockpt.org. Create a profile, set up reoccurring gifts. You can give online as a one-time donation, or you can mail in your checks to 4301 North College Street here in Newburgh. At this time, I'm going to pray for our tithes and offerings and pray for our pastor as he leads us this morning in a powerful time of the Lord. Father, thank you so much for the tithes and offerings. Thank you for the gift given. Thank you for the seed that was sown. I pray that you produce good fruit. Father, I thank you for the word that you're going to bring forth from our awesome senior pastor this morning. We thank you that your word is alive, it's living, it's active, and it's powerful. We pray that you would bless this time in Jesus' name. Lord, it's great to see everybody here tonight. We're filmed before a live audience, <laughs> and uh, I, I just want to begin uh, tonight. Uh, we're going to look at at table or this morning uh, conversations with Jesus on humility. And uh, on May third, Pastor Justin had a great word out of Luke fourteen one, and I just want to encourage everybody to go back there and uh, go through that video on Facebook. Uh, premiere on our, our on the Facebook page for Rock Point, and you can go and look at it. But I want to go through that same passage again, and just some insight I see uh, in that passage as well. And I just want to emphasize uh, something during the COVID season here uh, for all of us uh, t today. And uh, also, while we're going through this at table series, I just want to encourage everyone to go to. Uh, and rent the the series chosen. It's a mini series on uh, Vid Angel, and you can get that for fourteen ninety nine. And it's just a great series on the life of Jesus. And I just want to encourage that. Now let's all go in our Bibles this morning and look into Luke fourteen 
1 through 11. One Sabbath, when he went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, he was like the overseer of the Pharisees, there was, they're watching him carefully. And behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus responded uh, to, to the lawyers and Pharisees saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Then they took him and healed him, and he sent him away. And he said to them, which of you, having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day, will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply to these things. Now he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, when you're invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down at, in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And first point that I have here this morning is there is a higher law. You know, Jesus is in the table talk and he's uh, talking to the Pharisees and the uh, scribes, which were or the lawyers who were like legislators of the law that was out there, and also the Pharisees, and they're watching Jesus carefully. And somehow in this dinner time, uh, the while well, they're reclining at the table, somehow put before Jesus is this man who has dropsy. It looks like it's not coincidental. It's like they just about planted him there. They're exploiting uh, this, this man's illness and putting him in front of Jesus just to see what he's going to do about this uh, person. Now, dropsy is an old term for the swelling of soft tissues due to the accumulation of excess water. Usually, it's related to a heart disease that relates to a swelling of through water of the flesh. And so what you have, this dropsy, is a swelling in the flesh. His flesh was puffed up. And it's a spiritual lesson on what he wants to do to the heart of man. And just like Jesus would heal a blind person and give him sight, in, the, in the giving somebody uh, physical sight, he also wants to give that individual spiritual sight. And in the same way, in the healing of dropsy, which is this swelling of the flesh or this puffing up of the flesh, he wants to bring people to a place where they're healed and restored to a place of humility. In, in 1 Corinthians 8, 1, we read these words. Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess, possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Again, I want to just say that phrase. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. And 1 Corinthians 13, of course, known as the love chapter, in verse 4 it reads, Love is patient and kind, Love does not envy or boast, is not arrogant. And this is the same Greek word, fusio. And it has the idea like of inflating or puffing up. And uh, then it takes on the connotation of boasting or arrogance or pride. And the, the condition that the Pharisees were really dealing with was in their hearts, the, the sin of pride, spelled P. R-I-D-E, with the capital I in the middle. These individuals were dealing with pride. The compulsion to be right, but not to do right, was the problem there. And so what Jesus does here, he starts it off with a uh, generic question. He says, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And they, they remain silent on that. And Jesus is... Uh, 
actually baiting them here to see how they would respond to that situation if they were going to regard what he's about to do as work and then come as a judgment against him. And as they remain silent, Jesus goes and he prays for this man and he heals this man of his dropsy and then this man leaves the scene of this, uh, this story. And then he goes into a specific question and he says, said to them, which of you having a son or an ox that has fallen into the well on the Sabbath day will not immediately pull him out? Which of you? And he goes from a, a place where it's just a general question into a place where now it is a very specific one. And he wants to pull on their emotions and their heartstrings. And if you were in that particular situation, what would you do if your son or your animal, your ox, which would be a, uh, your large uh, agricultural uh, animal at that time, and very pricey and expensive, if that thing was to fall into the well, which would be pretty quite the scene, but if you, what would you do? You know, in 1987, there was a story in October where baby Jessica it fell in this uh, well, and rather than her, her aunt went inside to answer the phone, and as she came out, uh, her daughter was gone, uh, Jessica was gone, and she heard this uh, screaming, and down below, she had fallen 22 feet into a well. Well, they just didn't let this uh, go by and say, oh, we'll leave it for a few days. Rather, there was immediately emergency teams there. Then it became a media circus. And then there came some specialists on drilling. They did everything in their power to bring little Jessica out of that well into a place where she was back and living again. And she survived that traumatic event and uh, still is alive today. And when God looks at his sons and when he looks at his daughters, when he looks at his priceless, precious creatures, he is saying, hey, I want to restore you. I want to heal you. I want to redeem you. I want to rescue you. I want to bring you out from wherever you are at, whatever difficult situation that you're in. And you might feel like you have just uh, uh, given up all hope and there's despair in your heart right now. But Jesus wants to come to your uh, life right now and just say, hey, I am here for you to rescue you. And he says, hey, the higher law takes effect. The law of mercy will take precedent over the letter of the law. See, the, the purpose of the Sabbath, the purpose of the Sabbath just wasn't just to attend meetings. You know, I look forward even on the COVID uh, area of returning and gathering again, but the gathering isn't just to gather. It isn't just to follow a bunch of rules and make sure, hey, you need to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy and you better be there. No, the place of the Sabbath was to be a place of rescue, it was to be a place of healing. It was to be a place where the presence of Jesus was in the midst to bring restoration within the healing community. And that is the purpose of God's people gather together. It is a purpose of redemption. And if, if the question is, uh, my, here's the question you got to ask these Pharisees. How, and you got to take a look at yourself in, on this. Have I become so rigid, so unbending, so inflated with my own self-ideals that I have forgotten to minister to the people that are right in front of me? And that is the question. Is, is my heart soft? Is it willing to minister to people? See, knowledge, it puffs up, but love builds up. It helps to alleviate and elevate people from their, their status and their situation and their circumstances that they are in. It is a place of restoration. Now here's my second point tonight, or, th or this morning. It is the lowest place, L lowest place. Well, immediately, Jesus goes into a parable of the great wedding feast. And he goes into this, uh, he asks some, the guests, he looks at the guests, not at the Pharisees at this time, and the guests who were there. And he says, hey, when you go to a wedding feast, don't take the seats of honor. 
and only to be removed by the, the host there and brought to the lower seats. And uh, the sort of the walk of shame there. And he says, hey, when you t t come to a feast, take the low place. So the host comes to you and says, hey, friend, come up higher. And oh, there you are. You know, I, I know a, a couple of times I've been to Mariners baseball games up in Seattle, and you see these seats that are empty. And you say, those are better seats than my seats. And I am going to go sit in those seats. You leave your cheap seats and you move to the better seats. And you get into those seats and you're there for a couple innings and you're thinking, this is the life. And then the attendant comes and grabs you and says, hey, can I see your tickets, please? And you, they say, hey, you can't sit here. You haven't paid for these seats. You need to go back to where you, you're, you came from. And then in front of uh, 20,000 people, you take the walk of shame back to your, your, your seats. You know, you go b back to the lowest place, you know. Well, I, I'm talking about more than that as believers. You know, the, the, the big idea or the, the theme of this little passage here is this. For everyone who exalts himself, in verse 11, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. If you don't have that underlined in your Bible, you need to underline that in your Bible. That is a key thought. I believe there's an, an emphasis here that as a community of believers, we are to position ourselves in the place of preferring others. We need to put others before ourselves and, and let the Lord bring us up in his due time. In uh, this present uh, COVID world that we live in, there are COVID complexities. As pastors and elders here at Rock Point, there's uh, challenges that even presently we're working through this during this pandemic. You know, I, I so appreciate the team, um, the online presence. Before, in the middle of March, when we were starting this, we had no online presence. And I want to thank, uh, again, Tim Volner, uh, Thomas and Melissa West and all the musicians that have helped out making this great, Karen, and it's just been a, a great experience. And we just look forward to continuing to have some form of online presence. Now, things are beginning to reopen. And I, I don't want to think in a words of reopening. I, I, I like more re-entry. I, I feel the church has never been closed. In fact, we are more open than we ever have. With through the online presence, uh, we've reached people who haven't attended churches maybe for months. Uh, there's been expatriates who used to go to Rock Point who are still watching. And there's a whole group of people in the Newburgh and around the area who are, who are hearing the messages uh, on, on a Sunday morning. And praise the Lord, you know, for that. And I, I want to think the church is still open. But there are some logistical details that are constantly going to be worked through. Uh, the social distancing uh, we have, whether to wear mask or not to wear mask, uh, crowd size, church, children, what we're gonna do. And sometimes we can have these conversations with people who we know in the church and it can turn into a powder keg and it's sort of mixed with hysteria. And in the congregation, even within the, the leadership team, I would say, we contain a broad assortment of strongly held convictions. Some will be eager to meet and others will be, insist, hey, it's unwise to meet. And uh, how many know uh, Psalm 133? It says, how beautiful it is when brethren dwell together in Unity, unity. The lowest place means unity. The lowest place means a counterculture of sacrifice. The church has an opportunity at this time to demonstrate love and that places in interests of others before ourselves. You know, some might find it personally difficult, even maddening 
to stay six feet away. Th those people out there, I know who you are. You are huggers. And you're going to have a hard time with that six feet distancing. But here's the thing. If it turns out you're right, that there's no problem, can you sacrifice your ideals for a season? Just for a season out of love for others. And personally, you know, some of us might think, oh, hey, it's silly to be away from, or why are those people so sensitive to stay home? We, we're not to, as Romans 14 says, let us not pass judgment on one another any, any longer. Likewise, those who think the lockdowns should continue into the fall or into the new year. And yet there, you, you people are out there as well. And you should not pass judgment on those who feel there needs to be, uh, you know, uh, maybe a litigation to the government on, on checking out whether it's constitutional. Maybe you have a hard time with that. Well, maybe there needs to be a space of grace there for those individuals who share those opinions and have those convictions as well. Each of us, each of us in the body of Christ need to take the lowest place. It's not us or them. It is the body of Christ. We are one and we walk together as a unit and in love by the grace of God, moving forward into a community of unity, having things in common, the body of Christ. I just want to make a reminder of some verses. These are great verses. Philippians 2, 2 to 5. Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do not nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only at his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Having this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Colossians 3.12 says these words. Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. How many like the two words of humility and patience being put together in the same phrase? How many know we're, we're dealing with that right now? I, I need to do, keep a heart of humility, but at the same time, we need to have some patience here. Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is a validity in both sides, but again, it's not sides. We are representing Christ to the world in this season the best way we can. There's a story in uh, Numbers 5 or excuse me, in Nehemiah 5. And Nehemiah has uh, returned uh, from Persia. He was working in the palace of the king, and he now comes to Jerusalem. He's building the walls. He builds up the walls with all the people's help in 52 days. People are alongside their children, and they've got a, a spear in one hand, and they've got a trowel in the other hand, and they're working uh, to build up the 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 walls and they do it in 52 days. But after that in, in Nehemiah 5, this is what happens. There is a famine that hits the land. Well, the nobles who are having some of the, their Jewish workers um, are beginning to be taxed by them. And as they're beginning to be taxed, there's some exorbitant taxing that goes on into the place of usury which goes into the place of extortion, which goes into the place of these workers have to give their children up to go into slavery for the Jewish nobles. The nobles weren't being that noble. They weren't carrying a noble heart. 
And this is not how you treat community. And Nehemiah, when he gets this report, and it's, there's an outcry that goes out from all of the uh, workers and all of those who are experiencing their kids going into uh, slavery at this time, Nehemiah in Nehemiah 5.9, he says these words, So I said, the thing you are doing is not good. Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations, our enemies? Do you hear that? Hey, you need to keep the fear of God in this difficult season, in this hard season that we are going through, how you treat one another, everybody else out there is seeing how you're treating them and the nation. So what they were doing, you need to hear this, what they were doing was violating the responsibility of visually representing God to the nations on how they live together in community. When we violate that by diminishing our fellow members, we tarnish the nature of God to our world. People, the world will know we are disciples or we're followers of Jesus Christ by our, by our love, you know, by the selfless giving of ourselves. And back, back to the story here, what happens is after Nehemiah confronts this issue, they begin to return the properties. Uh, there's re a release of the slaves. They, they publicly confess their sin and they, they renew covenant as a community. They renew that unity uh, among themselves in unity. And guess what? You never hear of that famine again. And in this uh, pandemic world that we are living in, the, the, the one challenge that I'm calling for today, as we, each one of us, as we walk in humility, as we walk in peace, that we devote ourselves to being committed as, into loving one another through it all that we would have a heart for each, each other and, the, and, a, and a care. You know, the, the large gathering is vital. You know, it, it gives us our identity. There's a prophetic thrust that in, in the presence of the Lord. And we look forward to the times gathering again. But in the small gathering, which many people are joining in, in their uh, Zoom groups or whether they're meeting personally now with the uh, lifting up to 25, you know, to where two or three are gathered together, there I am in the midst. In other words, there is authority given in the small group. God wants to release that more and more as we pray together and not always have a Wall Street mentality where it says, hey, bigger is always better. Sometimes in those small groups and many times in the small groups, there, there is a power that comes through them. In the book of Acts, the, the response is uh, in the time of hardship, when there was a whether it be a famine or whether there be persecution, uh, they, they began to generously give to one another. You know, I love you so much, I'm going to help you through this rough patch. I'm not going to let you just, uh, you know, we're not talking about communism here, but we're talking about having a generous love, a generous care, and being ruled by the law of love in everything we do. And I, again, I want to say to Rock Point, you have been so generous to everybody. I've been hearing stories uh, throughout these last uh, two and a half months, and there is a, just an outpouring of love and grace. You know, the, the call of Rock Point at this time is to be a city on a hill. Now, the way those city on a hill would go, there would be like a um, big, the lights would shine from that city. It would happen. How did they know they were a city on the hill? Is They were in a time of darkness. And those people, when they would see those cities, they were looking for protection. They were looking for shelter. They were looking for a place to run to at that time. And we... 
the, the call of us to be a city on the hill is to become uh, something that the world would want to come to, that we would shine so brightly as, as a people of God, not taking, uh, talking about just having a church service, or, even though I like that personally, but we are a people who have learned to do life together. together. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. You know, here's how I want to leave. I want to say, hey, apply the higher law. Mercy versus just the letter of the law. B, take the lowest place. And here's uh, some, some areas. Uh, number one, we're hoping we'll be able to do outdoor services in some form of fashion on June 7th. Uh, please stay tuned on that. Uh, an outdoor service might be uh, depending on what is given and permitted by the governor, uh, that would be include either a drive-in church or uh, sitting in groups, uh, in social distancing groups outside where everybody could sit. And um, also we'll have Facebook Live. So even if those who are sensitive at those time are vulnerable population right now, we want to make sure that you're taken care of. But as we re-enter, we're praying by June 7th that some of this will be available, so please stay tuned. Two, I want to encourage everyone, speak well of one another, respect one another, pray for one another. Three, I want to encourage, refuse an us or them mindset. It is us. It is God's community. We're God's covenant community together. Number four. I want to encourage everyone to pray for our governor and just pray that that whole the state of Oregon and all those who are leading through the Oregon Health Authority, that they're going to have wisdom in this time. And last, number five, I want us to continue to pray. First Chronicle, Second Chronicles 714. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways and will forget I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Let's believe that people. Amen. Amen. Let's just close our eyes. Father, I just pray right now for Rock Point Church and all those who are watching all over the place. I just pray right now that there would just be such a working of humility in our hearts, Lord, that we would always not just want to alleviate other people, but we would try to elevate other people, Lord, that we would be exalting uh, the name of Jesus Christ, Lord. And Lord, if we have to decrease, and we do, we, we decrease, but you increase. And I just pray that spirit and grace would be on our church to manifest a heart of love one towards another, that we would be attractional to the world around us. And I just pray that you would do that continually. Thank you for Rock Point Church and every member and every person, and every family. And I just pray a mighty blessing on all of them. In the name of Jesus, everyone said, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Love one another. Grace of God be with you.